So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, very second panel session of the of the day, and uh, that is about keys to achieving digital transformation in government. My name is Enzo Lefebvre. I'm the working for the Agency for Digital Italy, and I will be moderating this uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, prominent speakers coming from uh, all regions of the world, actually, from uh, Ukraine to Brazil, passing through the States and uh, Europe. And uh, the idea today is to try to have bullets and, uh, and key points and also few challenges about uh, the, the things that we are expecting in terms of solutions for uh, projecting a new uh, era into smart cities, but as well much more broader that is uh, digital governance. Uh, the advance that we have had in digital governance in the last uh, few years have been amazing. And this is also thanks to digital solutions that are brought, uh, but as well that are then uh, implemented by cities or governments. And uh, so in order to explore what we are uh, what we have in, in, in practice nowadays. Uh, we will start by uh, Janina, that is uh, uh, Merilo, that is working for the office of the Ukrainian president as coordinator of eHealth, but she will actually tell us a bit more about the complexity of how to change a city and transform it digitally. Janina, the floor is yours and welcome to this session. Hello, everyone. Wow, I can hear myself. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And actually, this would be a small journey about transforming one city because I was uh, basically deputy mayor of one city, Dnipro, which is one million inhabitant city. And I wanted to tell you what can be done in a few years, basically two and a half years, in regards to transformation. When you have zero and you should be able to be or you should transform it to be fully digital. So this is kind of the beginning of the path of how uh, to transform a city based on one million city example, starting from zero. So what we did in two and a half years, you can uh, for later say if it's too little, too much, but it's a journey basically. So it started with, uh, basically we ended up in all of the rankings as being one of the top five, top three in regards to pure, uh, procurement, so open data, transparency, and so on. This was kind of the intermediate result of our journey two years later. But we started with opening all of the information and having a big game plan. Big game plan is called e-democracy program, which means what should be achieved in three years. And there was an outline of approximately 20 different programs which we wanted to achieve, which we wanted to do, starting from open data, ending with e-services, with different KPIs, basically, that what should be achieved. Not just let's open a data, but what do you mean by open? How many sets? What are the priorities? And so on. So based on this game plan, we started opening all the finances and basically information about finances because it's still all about the money which uh, is spent somewhere. So in Nipro, there is a procurement starting from from $100, so anything that the city procures, starting from $100 should be through open procurement platform. It's over thousands of procurements per month. It's a huge job, but it's completely open, basically. And you can monitor who is the winner, uh, or who got the contract, who is the beneficiary of this contract. It's all about open data uh, and open budget, basically. Uh, so then we started. Uh, engaging the people. It's not about openness just and about finances, but also about participation. And we dedicated approximately uh, or more than 1 million euro for participatory budget. It means that people can uh, uh, choose their problems and can participate in uh, in solving the problem. So government gives basically a million euros for um, approximately 100 projects and people vote for the projects, what they want to achieve or what is the priority. So it's basically direct democracy of uh, people have the money, people vote, people uh, choose their projects and submit their projects. Also, um, everything should be open in regards to uh, not just open as an open data, but uh, it should be comfortable to use as well. So, for example, we made a Google map uh, and uh, in cooperation with Google, uh, made everything visual. So basically here you can book your child to after school activity. You can find what is the closest, uh, I, I don't know, you love chess, what is the closest chess uh, class, 
you can book your time and uh, basically attend more than 100 of different after school activities based on this open map. It's about open budget that uh, what uh, resources are allocated next year to what infrastructure, for example, if I want to know what, uh, whether my kindergarten will uh, have a restoration or repair, you cannot uh, just search by addresses. It's a huge job. You can just open a visual Google map and see what the government plans to do next year from this budget. We have a contact center, which means that you can submit your online application, basically, or problem or suggestions. You can monitor it on real time, whether the city has sold it, how fast it has sold it, and mayor has a real, real time information in all of the uh, problems, which means, for example, there is a, a pipe broken, or there is a tree on the road, or any problem. Uh, it's all concentrated in this one contact center, and you have real time information information on all of the problems. It's about more than 100 e-services, but I think that services shouldn't be just e-services. Uh, we should cancel all the not needed services, create registries, connect registries, and um, it's not about creating as much as possible. It's about uh, creating as little as possible, which means that the aim is to transform digital only the solutions needed. Then we have, all, again, cooperation with Google for, pass, for creating passport for all of the roads. It seems very simple, but if you have one million city, we have more than 2,700 kilometers of roads, and which means we should know where it starts, where they end, what is the condition, and it's a very huge job to actually know all the information and to update it. Uh, in regards to what needs repair, is it light repair, um, is it uh, like um, capital repair. And uh, we start, try to in engage the startups and the community for solving all the problems. We don't try to like uh, make government responsible for everything. It's about um, engaging people and uh, launching startups. For, for example, for monitoring roads to engage the startup where you can uh, give your feedback on whether this road is in good condition, in bad condition. The government doesn't have to do everything. It has to engage and to give an opportunity or instruments to participate. And uh, as well, we launched the uh, open data portal so that uh, citizens could in be engaged and could utilize this data in a good way to launch the programs. Of course, it's about open decision making. It's um, you can uh, monitor over your um, city deputies on uh, what decisions they make, how they make decisions, uh, uh, how much they participate in decision making. You can view online transmissions or uh, YouTube transmission from all of the city sessions. We cooperate with Google, uh, with Waze, with Community Builder, when city can actually uh, submit their problems and uh, monitor what problems citizens submit. Of course, eHealth, it's a huge block. And we launched eHealth applications, which means um, you can book your doctor's time online, you can uh, see a patient record, and in one and a half years, we covered all of the ho city hospitals with the possibility to make an online booking, and over half of the population already books doctor's time online. Imagine that transformation from zero to half of population really using it. Then, of course, uh, different tourism Thank applications, you. and uh, one uh, half minute, half just a uh, cyber center, safe city, which means uh, all of the city cameras are connected to police, face recognition, number recognition, of course, e-transport, which means uh, e-ticketing, which means QR codes, bank cards, citizen cards, and so on. And it all was done in two and a half years. So truly appreciate this. Just um, one small example on what can be done. Do you think it's much? Yeah, if you can please raise your hand, I would appreciate if you think it's much that was done. Thank you. Uh, it, it was just interesting to have feedback as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yannicka. Now I pass uh, the word. Oh, huh? yep. Okay, sorry. Uh, I pass the word now to uh, to Bert Van Hoff from uh, Microsoft Azure, and uh, he's a great expert in IoT, and which is one of the biggest revolutions that we will have because he's as well uh, an important. Uh, development that we have we will have in cities is as well uh, an important base of tools in order to collect data to make our cities smarter so the floor is yours Bert. thank you all right uh, amazing how fast five minutes fly um, 
So digital transformation is, is a big topic and the big buzzword of the day. Um, we tend to think of that as a concept or an enabling concept that we call the digital feedback loop to which IoT is a key element. Um, you look at your operations, your product, your employees, your citizen or consumers and getting signal from the physical environment to inject all into that, into that mix, creating a virtuous cycle. Um, and that's really what we're trying to enable with IoT and that, that's been the journey uh, we've been on over the last five years. We're generally considered a leader in the IoT space and, and certainly Smart Cities is, is part of that journey. Um, there's a lot of challenges um, going from proof of concepts into a scalable real world solutions. We've had a lot of um, successes over the years. This event has been around for a long time. There's been a lot of investment. Great examples like what we've done in the city of Seville with, uh, with uh, spot solutions with Quamtra where we have sensors into the garbage cans uh, where we can look at the fill levels um, and that's where the operations of that uh, become a lot more efficient as a result. Um, not only can you reduce uh, or optimize the routes, but also reduce the amount of time uh, spent on emptying those garbage cans. And that's a real world solution that led to 66% improved efficiency, optimized routes going from uh, three collections in 12 days to one collection in seven days. Um, and so those spot solutions have existed. Uh, and there's a, a, a whole realm of these kind of uh, great solutions out there. But how do we scale them? How do we make them repeatable? Um, we're now in the city of Houston where we have 34 engagements across a wide spectrum, uh, across public sector and private sector collaboration, all the way from transportation to what's happening with smart buildings, smart education, and what we can do in schools. Um, a wide spectrum of those, those type of intersections. Um, and that's really the journey and the mission we're on. How do we democratize these kind of solutions, right? It's, it's not as easy as it seems. Uh, a lot of times building a proof of concept uh, at small scale is easy. Scaling it out um, is where the challenges lie. And we're creating more and more fabric to make that easier. Uh, we have a lot of great demonstrations on our booth, but uh, go beyond just pure raw cloud fabric uh, where we have great IoT solutions, but now leveraging it up into the SaaS layer, uh, software as a service component where we can make it a lot easier to build those solutions. Uh, we're pushing hard on new applications or new capabilities like IoT plug and play. If you think of the equivalent in the Windows world, way back when you needed to install drivers to make your printer work. Uh, this is kind of where we are in the IoT world still today. Uh, every integration is highly custom. Uh, you need a lot of custom code. And so we announced uh, activities around what we call IoT plug and play, which is currently in, in uh, public preview. Um, so those are great game changing elements. And then with uh, things like the SaaS layer with uh, solutions like IoT Central, we can uh, combine that with app templates for things like smart waste, air quality monitoring, uh, think smart parking, we now have smart water solutions, um, and really bootstrapping these type of solutions and make them easier to deploy. For us, that's all around partner enablement um, and make that scalable. Running these kind of services at scale, and certainly when you're a solution builder or a solution provider and not looking at a single application in a single city, you need very advanced capabilities like uh, multi-tenancy support, how can I run a global scale service uh, that I can replicate around the globe with high availability, disaster recovery? And this is where often projects in this realm fail, um, right? Where it gets, the going gets, gets tough uh, and where it's not as easy as it seems. So we're, we're on this journey to democratize these kind of capabilities, make it easier to build, bringing capabilities like AI. Uh, you've seen this progression from cloud as a core enabler then harnessing signal from the physical environment through IoT, running intelligence on the edge, uh, closer to where those devices are deployed, and then bringing in capabilities like AI, running that on the edge, and now evolution all the way into things like digital twins. So there's really this continuous spectrum of rapid evolution and involvement um, and evolution, and this is where we're 
investing a lot. We announced a year and a half ago that we're doubling down on our investments in IoT uh, with a five billion dollar investment over over five years. Uh, we're well on our way. We publish regularly what the results are of that, and um, I would say I invite everybody to our booth to learn more. Uh, there's a great learning hub where you can find out more about some of these solutions and, and their current state. And then we also have our um, AI business school, and that's specifically on applications of AI in the government sector. And there's a great activity on our booth as well to learn more about that. Lots of application around public safety, transportation, parking, smart buildings, uh, the whole spectrum. And ultimately, and the final thoughts on that is, by virtue of getting everything connected, where you get these spot solutions, the real opportunity then is to get everything interconnected. And if you look all the things we're doing around retail, logistics, supply chain, manufacturing, all of that ultimately feeds into new capabilities into the city as well, as well as smart buildings and how all of those things ultimately connect, certainly as we think about ports. Um, that's a good segue. Um, but that's where logistics, supply chain, all these things come into the mix and how that connects into the city fabric as well. Um, Thank you so much, Bert. And uh, as you actually introduced, we, we have now Jordi Torrent from the, he's the head of strategy from the Smart Poor Alliance here in Barcelona. And uh, as well, the, the importance here is, is not just logistics, but as well the future of trade, but as well the impact that it has on uh, on the environment and as well on, 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 on the climate efforts um, that we are having. So the floor is yours, Jordi. Okay, let me stand up because, so I can see the screen. Um, first, a couple of things before I start. I will try to stick, no, I'll, I'll say, I will try to stick to the five minutes. Um, first, uh, I'm the only one from Barcelona, so welcome to my city. Okay, second, I'm a quite an old-fashioned guy. I'm probably the only one here which has, it's not very good at technology. When I have a problem with my mobile, I give it to my 15-year-old daughter to solve it, okay? Um, third, I come from a sector uh, where the biggest invention in the last 50 years has been a metallic box, a metallic box of 40 feet, okay? This changed the world a lot. A lot. It made international trade possible I made possible that you wearing the clothes that you are wearing now today probably okay so um, I'm, I'm not a technology guy and and I wanted to say this okay and um, first this is about the government we as a port we don't like to consider ourselves government we are public company okay um, does it work another one here okay um, we are a public company um, and our main mission, uh, our, uh, how do I say the French, the raison d'etre, is to help our customers. When I speak of our customers, I mean, I mean shipping lines, uh, logistics operators, and shippers to be competitive in the global market. Okay, this is our main uh, reason of existence. Okay, and and. And today we are seeing that with e-commerce, uh, and who are these customers? What are these customers doing? No, they manage basically foreign trade. Okay, foreign trade, and. Which is the main challenge that ports and logistics chains, and I repeat, ports is something quite uh, antique. Okay, we, 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 it takes years to introduce some changes in our sector. Okay, so which is the biggest challenge that foreign trade is putting on us lately? E-commerce. Okay, I'm gonna forget ports when it comes to city ports, to uh, cruise, to uh, private yachts. I'm speaking about foreign trade, and which is our main challenge for the coming years? Helping our customers that manage e-commerce to be competitive, okay? Um, and what are we facing um, from these customers lately? Let me go backwards again. This is, this is something that is happening today in the port to which digitalization was very important, okay? Here, as you can see here, um, this is the logistic chain through our port of the top fashion and footwear company in the world. I'm not going to say the name. I'm probably you all know, know it. Um, and this happening today. This five, four, four, five, six years ago was impossible, I would say. The first time they came with their logistic providers, freight forwarders, shipping lines, terminal operator, rail operator, to tell us they wanted to develop this in our house, in our port. We told them, this is impossible. I mean, this was the first reaction. And this is happening today, so we are very proud to see that. You can see that this happens on weekends in the port. For all this, technology was very important, but it was, and why, why technology was very important? Um, sharing information, okay? We work in a sector that has worked for 60 years in very close silos, 
Shipping line doesn't share information with the terminal operator. Terminal operator doesn't share information with the freight forwarder. Freight forwarder doesn't share information with the truck driver. So for, for me, not being a technology guy, I repeat it, eh? sharing technology has ma allowed us to share information through the logistic chain and make things this, like this possible. So as you can see, we have boats entering the port on 8 a.m. in the morning. Have you ever seen a container vessel? I guess you have. No, these are 20,000 boxes, boats of 300 meters long, uh, three football pitches for your, for, uh, to have a comparison. They unload in a port in a single operation, 5,000, 7,000 containers. Of those, these in 24 hours. Of those containers, 100, 200 may belong to this company. They want them to send, they want them to send them by rail to a warehouse they have in Madrid on the, on the following day. This, goods are going to be sent in a warehouse on that night, Sunday night, and on Monday morning, this is going to be sent by plane, for instance, to Seattle. You are from Seattle, correct? Okay. So, um, so that it's in a shop in Seattle on Tuesday. Okay. So this is how technology and digitalization is helping the, port, the logistics suppliers to fulfill the requirements of our customers. Okay. Um, Without technology, this would have been impossible, but without sharing information, which is what technology is helping us uh, um, uh, either. We have another customer, Sports, which is our community, okay? our community, uh, the citizens of Barcelona. Um, and in this respect, and I'm going to finish here because I have only 27 minutes, the main driving force, 27 seconds, sorry, the main driving force for the coming years is going to be sustainability. So what we have to do as ports is to reduce the impact of our port community in the quality of the air, basically, of the city, to reduce our impact in climate change. And for this, the main uh, topic for the coming five years is going to be electrification. Okay? And I'm going to leave it here because I don't have much more time. If there's questions later, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, you, you actually supported the idea that uh, uh, there is the need as well of, uh, of embracing it all together with IoT, but as well with all the logistics into, into what is the platform capacity. So I pass the hand now to Hang Yong Sia, uh, who is the Senior Director of Huawei International in Singapore. And uh, I think he will be exploring exactly how the platform capacity of Huawei is, uh, is done and uh, what we have in place yeah. right now. Thanks, Enzo. Good morning, everybody. Hi. I'm with Huawei, but um, I spent half my working life with the Singapore government. So um, I, I like to say I have a little bit of inkling of what government is looking for when we're doing digital transformation. <clears throat> so basically, the challenges, I'm sure, is prevalent they, everywhere. They we have this problem. Users, businesses, everybody who deals with the government, they want to have services anytime, anywhere, on demand, in various multi-channels. I think that's going to be a given moving now from now onwards. And people are more demanding. They want to have better interactions with the government. So when we think about digital transformation, both from my previous background and from a Huawei's perspective, there are several key considerations that we always look at. The first one, stakeholders needs. Simple, everybody knows. But what does that really mean? It means that we really have to consider within the government, our employees who have been working there for the past 30 years, 40 years, who have never had a handphone previously and all the way now to a smart device. How do you get them to embrace digital transformation? From a user perspective, the young, the millennials, who have never known what is pen and paper, you know, note taking is all about. How do you get them to be able to share their ideas effectively across with all the stakeholders? So this, this is one of the things. But more importantly, we are seeing a lot of demand for co-creation, facilitation. People want to be involved. Other aspects that we can look at really is from capability development. When we talk about capability development, we are not just talking about within the government. We are talking about the people, their IT savviness. We are talking about the businesses. Are they able to support the government on this digital transformation, this ecosystem to help us do our work? Integration between policies, ops, tech. Are we able to see an upward spiral whereby they are able to support one another to create a positive impact? And lastly, resilience and security. Is it safe? Are we able to keep it within, self-contained? And that's not 
susceptible to dangers out there. And as I'm from Huawei, we will always think that it's very important also for us to have a common digital platform, a platform that can tie all the common technologies together. We heard about the IoT technologies, we heard about cloud, we heard about GIS, we heard about big data, artificial intelligence. But to a lot of people, to a lot of government, these are very disparate technologies that are there but not easy to use. How can we make it easier? And that's what we are trying to do with a digital transformation. So through this platform, you can see that all this data used to be disparate, work on their own. So only departments that have the budget, that have the capability, they are able to leverage on all this technology. But if we are able to change this, we're able to move it into a digital platform with a digital enablement on top, and we make it easy for people to use, for the government agencies to use, small departments who are able to leverage on this and able to deliver their services more efficiently and effectively. Wouldn't that be nice? And that's what we are really trying to do for this, for our Horizon digital platform. Basically, what this platform is trying to do and really how we, we really feel that's really important is we see a convergence of the digital world and the physical world together. We get lots of data. We get legacy data from your legacy systems. We see your IoT data that we have been talking about, all your devices. We get social media. We get internet. We get all this barrage of information. So how do we do that data assess? How do we do that data convergence? How do we do that data processing? How can we make it easier for us to sense make out of this data? So that's one key thing. The other thing, for, for a government for, to, to, to move on their digital transformation journey, they can't just depend on one vendor. It has to be a huge ecosystem. Everybody participate together. A platform should allow that, should be open, should allow collaboration, collaborative effort. Everybody can come together so that they can create their solutions easily. And that's what we really want to do with the digital platform. Ultimately, with an open platform, this will pave the way for a richer ecosystem, and this will mean better services for the people, for the businesses in the longer run. So the imperative for digital transformation will always be there. So that for us, the way we see it, we have spoken to many governments, we've spoken to many clients. There are always a few key things that we hold very closely to our heart. I think leadership is always very, very important. So with leadership, you're able to break down silos. You're able to drive collaboration, get everybody to work together. You need an execution team who are able to coordinate, who are able to collaborate and get everybody together. You need a strong ecosystem where everybody can participate together and play together and deliver you things together. Right? And, but lastly, and I, mo I think more importantly, from a funding perspective, you need to have sustainable funding so that we can make sure that our digital transformation can be a continuous and ongoing journey successfully. So and with that, I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And as part of the conversation is, uh, it's also about data and, and how we actually elaborate data. Part of the things that we are going to confront now with uh, Peter Pirinjad is uh, that is the Senior Director for Global Public Sector Strategy of Oracle is uh, exactly on that and the capacities that we have on, on governing data. Do we have the slides? Here we go. Thank you, Peter. Okay. The first All right, thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. Hope everybody is having a good time. Are you awake still? Yes? How many people work for cities? Good job, thank you for your service. So 20 years I worked in government and then last year I came to Oracle because I really believe that Oracle has the city's best interest in mind. I wouldn't have gone to a different company if I didn't believe that to be true. So I came to Oracle with a vision to try to help cities solve problems and Oracle this last year at Open World made that public announcement that they're more focused on the human story than the solution. We invite you to have a conversation with us to talk about your problems and how Oracle can solve them. So we live in a very disrupted and globalized community 
correct? We find ourselves in now the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution in 1760 was around railroads. The second industrial revolution was around electricity, assembly line, mass production. The third one in the 1960s was around the computer age, correct? Now we see ourselves in the fourth industrial revolution. We see ourselves in a more connected, an area of more connections, IoT. We see ourselves doing things that we never thought possible. Sometimes a little scary. That's why it's so important that you are trusted to work with companies and vendors that really have your best interests in mind. So the pace of adoption is quickly changing. How many of you remember the radio? Who was even around when the radio came online in 1920? I don't see too many people born in 1920, but in 1920, it took us 38 years to get 50 million subscribers, 38 years. Today, how many years does it take to get 30 million subscribers? Can anybody guess? How many years? 10 years? Less than 10 years? 19 days, 19 days. Pokemon, 19 days to get 50, 30, 50 million subscribers. Today, Facebook has 2 billion subscribers. They started in 2004. In two years, they had 50, uh, 30 million. The public trends for cities, the things that they're challenged with, excuse me, 75% of budgets in local government go towards services. That pays for people's salaries, their pensions, their benefits. That is a major expense. They can't increase their, their spend on personnel. They need to be agile. They need to be using technology to augment what staff does to improve their services. We know that 75% of global workforce will be millennials by 2025. We also know that by 2020, by, 20, uh, by 2020, 30 billion IoT-enabled devices will be online. That's only a year away, correct? By 2050, 68% of the world's population will be in cities. Imagine the, the stress being placed on city services, serum, community services, land use services, development, etc. It's really important that we leverage data and we leverage systems. So the key, the key questions facing cities in a research study that we did that will be released today publicly with ESI Thought Labs was that the key questions facing cities are these four. The characteristics of a smart city. What are the characteristics? What, it, what makes for a smart city? Number two, what is the rate of return? How can we measure the rate of return on our investments for smart technology? Number three, what technology is helping our citizens live better lives? What technology is improving the businesses and thriving business in our communities? And the fourth one is how do we fund these technologies? What do we do to find revenues to offset the expenses of implementing these technologies? So we identified 10 attributes and I won't go into them, but these 10 attributes make for a smart city. This was based on a research study that we did that will again be released today. I encourage you to come to our booth and to learn more about this study. It was then done in collaboration with many other public and private sectors. 136 cities globally participated, and we just released a new study today that takes a deeper dive into 100 of those cities to identify what makes the smartest cities hyper-connected today. The focus is data. Everything relies on data, the interoperability of data, the ability to use that data and make good insights, helpful insights for cities to operate better. Everything has to do with the data. That is the central common denominator. And Oracle takes a three-pronged approach to that. Number one, we establish a platform, a place that you can put your data secure in a data lake to make sure that it's interoperable, shared between departments as well as agencies outside of your city or agency. Number two is the actual uh, platform and all of the services that sit on top of that platform, including your SaaS, including all of your ERP solutions, your HCM solution, your CX solutions. We also look at both the front office and the back office, not just what's happening in the back of uh, the HR departments and the finance departments, but also the customer experience and how to improve that exchange and making it frictionless. And this is all in our Gen 2 secure cloud to ensure that you're secure and that your data is safe. Again, I would invite you to come to our booth. Oracle has got a brand new vision, a new mission, is that we want to make better insights available to our agencies that we support. And we would invite you to come and look at our Lego display, have a conversation with the ESI Thought Labs uh, research 
uh, personnel that did this collaboration with us and see all the things that we have to share with you. So thank you for your time. Have a wonderful conference and come visit us in booth 492. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, we, we started this panel with actually with a vision on, on how a central government uh, is actually implementing digital transformation. And we go down to the local governance capacity. Of, uh, and we have with us Tiago de Paula de Silva Pessoa from uh, Codemar, which is the development agency of the city of Maricá in the nearby, in, 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 the, in the middle of, of Brazil. So thank you for, for being with us and uh, please share with us what is the, he, he will be speaking in Spanish. So I will, at the end of, uh, of his speech, I will try to pack uh, the contents of, uh, of his intervention for non-Spanish speakers. The floor is yours. Obrigado. Gracias. Buenos dias. Mi nombre es Tiago de Paula, soy superintendente de Codemar S.A., una compañía pública creada por el municipio de Maricá, Brasil, responsable por la ejecución del Plan de Desarrollo Integrado del Municipio y las inversiones para introducir y estructurar actividades económicas en la región metropolitana del Rio de Janeiro. La ciudad de Maricá es una área de expansión de la, de la región metropolitana del Rio y es importante porque Rio es el principal productor de petróleo de Brasil y tiene una de las mayores reservas de petróleo del mundo, la llamada camada pré-sal, un descubrimiento en aguas profundas que empezó la producción en 2016 con un pronóstico de fuerte crecimiento de 25 a 30 años de, de exploración. En ese contexto, la pequeña ciudad de Maricá, que era un municipio dormitorio, empezó a recibir royalties de petróleo que en el próximo año serán alrededor de 450 millones de, de dólares. Porque los principales campos de explotación de presor están en su mar territorial. Es por eso que el municipio decidió, decidió prepararse para el desarrollo con el fin de evitar un error común, convertirse en una ciudad rica, pero su gente sufre los impactos del desarrollo sin poder participar de los beneficios. Por lo tanto, elaboramos un plano de inversión pública y privada para reposicionar económicamente al municipio en la cadena de producción de petróleo, investir, invertir en infraestructura y diversificar la matriz económica del municipio con el apoyo de la transformación digital. En el corazón de esta estrategia está la creación de un distrito de innovación con la misión de abordar los desafíos tecnológicos de Prasar y, sí, y así también los desafíos urbanos, sociales y económicos de la región. Hemos creado un programa para estructurar un distrito de innovación, un nuevo centro urbano, un lugar para vivir, producir y crear, totalmente preparado para experimentar las tecnologías de ciudades inteligentes, un laboratorio vivo capaz de demostrar y validar nuevas tecnologías de manera a facilitar su introducción en ciudades, con el apoyo necesario para nuevas ideas y nuevos negocios. En 2020, investiremos 50 millones de dólares y entregaremos las obras en 2021. Además, Codemar S.A. ha asociado a R.C. para implantar ArcGIS de manera integrada por todas las ag agencias públicas de Maricá. También hemos establecido asociaciones con organismos regionales y nacionales, de modo que hoy el municipio ha integrado la información en una única herramienta. Desde donde están matriculados los niños, las áreas ambientales, la atención médica, la zonificación urbana, transporte y aparcamientos públicos, incluso la operación del aeropuerto municipal y mucho más. En el mes pasado, en tres meses, 
hacemos eso. El mes pasado recibimos el premio de excelencia por el uso de la plataforma para la transformación digital gracias a su visión integrada. El municipio también creó una moeda digital para, para un programa de Basic Income, Renda Básica de Ciudadanía, donde conservamos los ingresos en las, la renda en la ciudad y también geramos datos de los gastos con eso. Eso mejora la política pública. También construimos en un año un aeropuerto inteligente responsable por la operación logística del Prasar. Instalamos 250 kilómetros de fibra óptica, cámaras inteligentes para seguridad, tráfico y otras iniciativas. Criamos también un fondo garantidor con 10% de recursos de petróleo para garantir la seguridad de los investimentos y para utilizarlo en tiempos de crisis petrolera. También hay grandes inversiones privadas en, en funcionamiento en Maricá. Una inversión española de 3 mil millones de dólares en la construcción de cinco resorts y dos hoteles. Y una inversión multinacional de 2 mil millones de dólares para construir un puerto con la mayor profundidad de la América Latina. Entendemos que la clave para la transformación de las ciudades es la visión holística e integrada de sus políticas públicas e inversiones privadas, articuladas a través del desarrollo tec tecnológico, con soporte digital, en asociación con el sector privado y un enfoque en mejorar la calidad de vida de la población. Gracias, Tiago. Gracias. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Tiago. So um, we have five minutes left before the end of the, of the session, but I would like to, in a way, impose the fact that we have been too many uh, to speak and uh, open the floor if there is any question. Otherwise, I have few questions. There is one question there. Please introduce yourself very briefly and just one question and to whom you want sure, to address. Sure. Uh, my question is to Janika. And my name is Nitin Agrawal. I am from India. I am representing Hewlett Packard Enterprise here. Uh, so, Janika, you said about uh, the e-health initiative that you are taking. Now, uh, how are you taking the data of the hospitals that you have across the country or the city in your central platform? Uh, have you connected all of them? Very so brief. Answer. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, to put it shortly, we have an identificator of the person or of the patient, which means the number that identifies the patient. We have the standards in government level, and we are interconnecting it through one database. So basically, there is one patient database, and we have certain standards that should be implemented in the hospital level. So basically, all the main data is drawn from the central database. Any other question? Okay, then I, I, I would pose uh, a couple of questions. The first one, I think, that uh, would go to, to Han, and uh, exactly on, on, on the most important elements that you think that are enabling those platforms to, to be able to, to actually concretize in, in, in everything aspect that we've been talking from ports to IoT uh, to uh, innovative procurement, uh, e-health, and data collection? I, I guess the most difficult thing um, is to get data, get people to share their data. That has been my experience when I was with the government. So I think it's important that the platform in question must be able to convey um, the value it can bring to the stakeholders. That is very, very important. It's not a build them and they will come mentality. That will never work. So it's important that the platform that you build make sure you are able to create value and let the stakeholders see the value, then that's where they are, in, they are willing to come on board. 
Second thing is you want it to be as open as possible, as collaborative as possible, so that you can get every types of of um, your, you can use the existing legacy systems. You can use new vendors, new ideas that's constantly coming up, and tap onto this platform. So this open platform must allow for that collaboration for all different types of vendors to come together in an open manner. So I think these are the two aspects: value and openness. So that's very important. Thank you. And Peter, uh, one of the things that we've been uh that, that we are here for is exactly exploring what smart cities are doing. Uh, there are some smart cities that are leading in this, uh, in this venture. So what are the key elements that are actually enabling them to lead uh, yes. in, in, in the smart cityness? The key element is the data, as we've been talking about today. The key element is having a platform to be able to store that data, ensure that it's secure, ensure that it's interoperable, ensure that you're getting better insights from that data. Having the data there is not enough, but you have to do something with it. But it has to be structured, and government data is oftentimes unstructured. It's very complex data. Unlike in retail and other, it's very structured data, and it's really more about how to drive better analytics from it. What Oracle does is has a powerful ability to not only store and secure the data, but to create structure from that data to improve better insights. So we ensure that um, our latest applications, whether they're on-premise or in the cloud, uh, whether they're our applications or our partners' applications in partnership with Microsoft and SAP, we've really become a customer-facing, customer-focused industry and, um, and company to ensure that not only are we able to provide better insights, but we give you the decision, the choice, to use your applications or your database. We're here to provide answers and uh, partner with you in that, in that process. But the bottom line is the data that you have to make sure you have. Bert, one very last question, and, and then very last to Jordi, but IoT means a lot energy. So what is the combination and the challenge to save energy into the IoT dimension that uh, we are taking over? Uh, energy is such a broad topic, but certainly um, we do this in the context of smart buildings. Um, we've certainly done that on our campus with cities. Uh, we have a pretty big play there, but just to give you a sense, on our campus in Redmond, it's pretty big. Uh, we have 125 office buildings, 165 structures. We have the largest utility bill in the region, not counting data centers, which is a whole different topic, but we went from a $65 million utility bill to $52 million in three years, all through harvesting existing infrastructure in what's in most commercial buildings today. We did not install an, a single new sensor. Uh, that was three decades of building construction, seven different building automation, building management systems, and it's just, just harvesting existing data from the BMS systems through uh, infrastructure like BACnet. Um, we can do all of those things. We have a strong deep play in the utility sector as well. We've done amazing work um, in key countries like Norway, where we have an immense penetration of electric vehicles, which put a tremendous strain on the grid, where we did a whole bunch of uh, unique uh, forecasting and optimization algorithms, um, having both a cost deferral but uh, optimization of the grid at large. Uh, so there's all those elements, but then you get all the way into logistics and optimization. I even used the smart waste scenario. Uh, if you look at the reduction of the amount of trucks that need to rotate, uh, less pollution, less uh, consumption of energy. On this, I, I would like, what is, the, what is the ability of smart ports uh, to combat climate change? Well, I said at the end of my presentation, the. The thing today is electrification. When it comes to electrification of the world, so that the vessels, when they come to the port, they are connected instead of having their engines running and, and using fossil fuels. Uh, then it's transforming the fleet of trucks into uh, electric trucks. Um, I would say that the last three, four years, uh, the step forward is, is very big. I mean, we have, we're going, we have, I mean, you see ports like in California, LA, Long Beach, where 70% of the calls of container and cruise vessels, they are uh, plugged in in the, in the wharves. And so this is going to go, I think, quite fast. The main question mark still is the, 
uh, the fuel foil, uh, oil used for transportation, for maritime transportation, there's still no al mass alternative to petrol, still to oil. Um, uh, natural liquefied gas is a good alternative, but it still it helps in fighting pollution, but not climate change. So there's lots of research going on with hydrogen, with ammonia, with things like that, which will come later, but uh, I would say on the medium term. When it comes to ports, is electrification. And um, energy generation with solar plants, things like that, which ports are huge places where you have, can generate a lot of energy um, with the, the facilities you have there. Thank you so much. So, really, uh, thank you uh, to all of you for for having shared uh, your ideas. I think that uh, they enable us to to have a broader vision. I think that uh, what I've seen from each of your speeches is exactly what uh, we represent in Italy with our digital strategy that is uh, uh, based on very concrete infrastructure, then based on uh, on the data capability, uh, enabling platforms interoperability layer and then the various ecosystems in Italy we have citizens public administration and business as the three main ecosystems and then on top of that we have uh, design and, and and development of uh, of products on top of it if everything works well we have artificial intelligence and blockchain solutions or other emerging technologies as us uh, barriers of this, uh, what we call it, the panettone, because we are very attached to food. Uh, we have the security uh, component vertical and the data vertical. And, and all those elements, I think, have been shared uh, here today as well uh, from uh, seeing exactly what is the role of uh, major governments, but as well small cities in trying to uh, become smarter. Uh, but more than that, to become human-centric. So thank you very much to all of you and uh, to you for having stayed uh, here until five minutes later as we started very late. Thank you so much for also the technicians uh, and, uh, and all the staff that uh, has been facilitating the contribution to this. So thank you again. Bye.